uh, so the, the name kind of indicates the name kind of indicates uh, that Oregon Shores, um, although over the past 50 years, our uh, focus has continually uh, expanded until we now work on everything from the crest of the coastal mountains to the edge of the continental shelf. We work on a whole range of things from marine conservation to shoreline management to um, uh, land use planning, water quality, endangered species. There's nothing more important that we work on though than protecting estuaries uh, where the land meets the sea, they're crucial habitats themselves, and they also interact in important ways with the nearshore ocean. So Oregon's uh, piece of the global mandate to protect uh, our ocean, uh, ocean habitats is to uh, first and foremost to protect our estuaries. And a very critical component of estuarine ecosystems is eelgrass, which is our subject for tonight. Um, we've just taken the first step a big step uh, in a long journey to uh, protect Oregon's estuaries. Uh, we just did, and I mean just produced a, uh, a citizen's guide to getting involved in protecting uh, eelgrass. And I mean, uh, we, we've uh, finished it about half an hour ago. Uh, it was uh, funded uh, in part by both the Pew uh, Charitable Trusts and the city of Coos Bay, so we thank them. And it's not yet up on our website, but in, within a few days, it will be and will be available to, uh, to anyone. And as I say, it's the first step because the state of Oregon is beginning to examine all of the estuary management plans for its estuaries up and down the coast. And that'll, this will be a process of ease and it's, as they say, a critical, uh, critical issue for us to protect them. So Oregon Shores will be heavily involved with that over the years. Um, the first two uh, estuaries to be covered are Yaquina and Coos Bay. And so we'll be focusing, focusing particularly on Coos Bay this evening. Um, so uh, I'm, my pleasure to, is to introduce two speakers tonight. Handling the, uh, the natural history end will be uh, marine scientist Mike Grable, uh, known to many on the coast for as a, a long career as manager of the South Slough uh, National Estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, he is a resident of Coos Bay um, and uh, 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 graduated from or got his master's from the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology right there at the mouth of the bay. Uh, he's also, uh, by the way, uh, both a scuba diver and a commercial fisherman. So uh, Mike will cover the, the eelgrass itself and then to talk about the uh, land use planning and citizen involvement and will be a new Sakar. He's the attorney we work with. She's the uh, uh, coastal, I mean, she's the Craig Law Center's uh, Coastal Law Project Legal Fellow, Coastal Law Project being our partnership, Oregon Shores partnership with the Craig Law Center. Um, I knew, uh, got her uh, uh, JD from Cornell and returned to Portland where she, she grew up and uh, began to work with Craig in uh, January of 2019 and immediately ran into a major baptism of fire. She has been handling all the work we've done, especially on the Jordan Cove LNG plant. And um, she's the person more than any other who uh, uh, led the charge on uh, the, the uh, successful appeals recently of Jordan Cove. She's also the principal author of the uh, report that we've just completed. So with that, I turn it over to Mike Grable. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. It's a beautiful sunny evening on the Oregon coast. So uh, my thanks to all of you who are uh, taking the time out of your evening this evening to watch and participate in this program. Uh, my responsibility uh, in this evening's presentation is to give you a little bit of a primer on the natural history and the ecology of eelgrass. Uh, and that's something that's been a subject matter interest to me for some time. Uh, so I thought I would take you on a 15 minute or so walk through some of the thoughts I've had about eelgrass uh, through, through the years. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll share that. And I want, uh, could I get someone to confirm for me that you're viewing my screen? Yes, Mike, looks great. Okay, so now I'm up to full screen. Uh, and my presentation this evening is really focusing on eelgrass meadows. I'm gonna shrink myself down here. 
Uh, and the, it's already been mentioned that these eelgrass meadows are these flowering plants that live in Oregon's shallow water estuaries. Uh, and the most important thing about them is that they turn this two-dimensional area of tide flats into this remarkable three-dimensional realm. Uh, and so I thought that we could just dive in a little bit uh, and, and consider what eelgrass is uh, and what role it plays or a few of the roles that it plays uh, and uh, what it might mean for taking care of eelgrass uh, here in Oregon's estuaries. So uh, first of all, it's important to recognize that this is, eelgrass is a curious beast uh, it's a flowering plant that sheds its pollen uh, into the water uh, and it's carried through the water uh, to the flowers uh, of adjoining eelgrass plant flowers uh, and they get pollination and they make seeds. So it, it is a grass-like uh, environment. Uh, here, can you see my cursor? Okay, it, it makes these rhizomes, they're connected underneath the surface of the, of the sediment. Uh, and then these leaves or blades stick up above. The seeds are really tiny. Uh, three millimeters is about how wide the lead of a pencil is. So uh, it's, we're talking about a teeny tiny, um, teeny tiny flower and a teeny tiny seed. But somehow I know that they make it happen. This is what it looks like in real life. Uh, th this is the edge of an eroded uh, seagrass meadow uh, that's in South Slough, right at the, near the entrance to Coos Bay. Uh, but at low tide, these meadows lay flat. But this, uh, this illustration shows those roots and rhizomes that are typically below the surface of the sediments, but are exposed in this case because this is uh, late winter. Uh, and wind waves have uh, eroded the sediments uh, at the edges of the meadow. Okay, so let's, how comes my, there we go. So here's uh, an example of an eelgrass meadow that's functioning and it doesn't have an eroded edge. You can see that it's just kind of this, uh, it's kind of an irregular shape. Uh, it has open channels, there's sand adjoining it. You can also notice that eelgrass stabilizes the sediments because the areas that don't have eelgrass in it, the mud or the surface of the sediment is lower. So when you, the, the eelgrass slows the currents down and stabilizes the sediment. So it helps to protect the coast from erosion. When you put it all together, uh, eelgrass ends up being uh, a, quite a complicated system. Uh, and it's just one piece of it, but it's a central piece of this complex system. So the first thing I could point to is the fact that the actual blades of the eelgrass form a substrate in an estuary, which is a very, very rich place and living things attach themselves to uh, the blades of eelgrass uh, and that and collectively those living things that uh, that connect themselves to the eelgrass blades are called epiphytes uh, they're plants that grow on the surface but there's a whole community of of uh, organisms uh, such as this uh, sea hare or sea slug uh, that forages on the epiphytes that grow on the blades of the seagrasses. Of course, in the adjoining mudflat, you don't have that situation. So the richness of the life that's there is, uh, is supported in part by just the blades of themselves. The other thing that happens in an eelgrass meadow is the, those roots and rhizomes that I showed you stabilize the, uh, the sediment that's below it and a whole community of things lives below it. And when uh, I was out on that low tide that I showed you the eroded margin of an eelgrass bed, where the eelgrass had been washed away, uh, the surface of the sediments was winnowed away and below the surface of the sediments, it revealed 
these clams uh, that were that had been living underneath the eelgrass bed before it was eroded away. And for any of you who uh, dig clams on the Oregon coast, I bet you never saw them that dense. I was really surprised. When the high tide comes in, this three-dimensional structure uh, of the eelgrass meadow really comes into play. Uh, and this picture illustrates fish that are uh, hovering just above an eelgrass bed. But I can assure you that there's also organisms that live within the blades of the eelgrass. And one of my favorites is in the top right uh, corner of this image. This is the bay pipefish. Uh, it's a type of a seahorse, uh, for those of you who might be familiar with seahorses, a really curious animal. Uh, the bellies of these uh, creatures, of the males, has this hollow opening called a brood pouch. And it's actually the male seahorses that brood the young. And I put a little asterisk here to say that the location of an eelgrass bed really matters to a lot of creatures. Because you can imagine uh, this, this bay pipefish doesn't hang out in an eelgrass meadow that's in the intertidal and is exposed at low tide. It has to move in and out with the tides because it's a fish. Uh, and the same way with any of the other fish that use eelgrass beds, they're a mobile community that moves in and out and uses eelgrass when it's covered by, um, covered by the tides. So that's what's going on in an eelgrass bed, but the act, biological activity in an eelgrass bed uh, starts to attract attention from highly, other highly mobile organisms. And in this case, one of my uh, totems uh, for eelgrass is a beautiful go sea goose called the black brant. Uh, this is a bird that's found on the Atlantic and Pacific shorelines. Uh, it's an obligate eelgrass eater. Uh, this bird is fully dependent on eelgrass. Uh, and here's a picture of the lower portion of Coos Bay at low tide with perhaps, I don't know, 500 or, or, or so black brant foraging on the eelgrass. That's just an example of one highly migratory species. These birds breed up in Alaska in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. So they stop in Coos Bay in the spring to forage on the eelgrass as fuel for their migration. Another species that uh, uses Oregon's estuaries in abundance and eats eelgrass are American widgeons. And it's just one of a number of species of birds uh, that depend on eelgrass as food. But I think the most remarkable thing that happens uh, in eelgrass beds uh, in Oregon and elsewhere throughout the world is that some animals use eelgrass as a place to complete their breeding cycle. And in this case, in front of my house here in the lower bay, I have been watching for the last, oh, 15 or 20 years, uh, one week uh, around Valentine's Day, there's suddenly a change in activity of the birds and everything else. Uh, and it turns out that that's because Pacific herring swim into the bay en masse uh, and, and lay their eggs on the eelgrass meadow uh, in front of our house. It's hard to describe the uh, density uh, of, of uh, biological activity that happens in an eelgrass bed, but the example on the left is a little strand of algae that shows uh, individual herring eggs attached to it. And this image on the right just shows that the eggs get so dense it changes the color of the tide pools because every possible surface is coated with these eggs. So you could imagine what 150 acres of these eggs might look like or how many individual herring would be represented by a single 10 acre uh, uh, eelgrass bed. When that herring spawn happens, it's, it, the, it doesn't go unnoticed by living creatures. And here's an example of some uh, surf scoters that are diving uh, on it. The herring come in for one day uh, and they lay all their eggs in one event and then they're gone. When the herring are present, there's sea lions, there's seals, there's diving birds like cormorants uh, that are feeding on the fish themselves. 
But the next day, those birds are gone because the only thing that remains to eat are the eggs. And here in this case is, uh, is some diving birds. Let me just jump up here. These are scoters that are feeding over a, an eelgrass bed at Fossil Point. And I'll just play this video for you shortly. Uh, it, it is a remarkable thing to see. Uh, in the span of two days, you can go from seeing 100 birds or so before uh, the herring spawn starts to tens of thousands of birds cue in on this thing. Now, these scoters are diving sea ducks. They also nest up in Alaska, and uh, they're fueling themselves on herring eggs for their migration to the north. There's the entrance to the harbor right there in Coos Bay. Anyway, uh, so that's just a sample of the buzz that happens. I've just shown you two species of birds, but rest assured other species are keenly involved. Migratory shorebirds, uh, local resident gulls also get in on the action. And when the tide is up, the ducks are feeding on it. When the tide is down, the shorebirds and the gulls are feeding on it. These areas are the most productive places on planet Earth. Uh, and I can't emphasize that enough. The, the, the scientists who have studied these things have clearly identified them as being biologically productive hotspots uh, on the planet. So there's a whole group of other animals that use the, um, use the eelgrass beds just for part of their life cycle. And this is an example of little tiny baby Dungeness crabs that move into the estuary by the tens of millions each spring and go through a transformation uh, uh, from a swimming larval form to the crawling larval form. And eelgrass is very important for that. Eelgrass grows and dies. Uh, it gets torn up by the brant geese uh, and moved around. They kind of garden these eelgrass meadows. And the drift, the production that's put out Moves, it moves around to other locations in the estuary, but it also gets exported out into the ocean. And we shouldn't forget that uh, we're not really ocean creatures, but out there is 70% of planet Earth. And I've had the good fortune of being fishing uh, for salmon um, and for albacore tuna 40 miles offshore to see eelgrass uh, floating around in the oceans and to know that the only place uh, that eelgrass grows and reproduces uh, are in estuaries. So they're these estuaries are sending signals to the open ocean as well as to the coast. So I hope I've convinced you that eelgrass is important and it's a big deal and it should be protected. So how do you go about looking after eelgrass? Uh, and for me, uh, I can tell you that the answer to that is it's really complicated. Illustrated here is a European green crab, which is an introduced species. Uh, it came into uh, Oregon waters in the ballasts of ships, uh, and now it's established in most of Oregon's larger estuaries. It's a voracious little crab, and it bites the bases off of eelgrass. So here's a situation where green crabs have a negative, or an introduced species has a negative consequence. But that's not the only thing. Just pointing out over here at my cursor, you see this little thing, that's a, uh, that's a, a colonial animal. Uh, some people call them bryozoans. Uh, that's a beautiful little creature that's growing on the surface there. Well, if we, if we zoom back and say, well, so where is all this important stuff? Green, the green places show where eelgrass lives. And you can see compared to Oregon, I mean, this is only a little chunk of Oregon, probably bend might be right here, uh, there, there, it doesn't occupy very much of our state. Even if you combine it with surf grass, which is another type of seagrass that grows on the open rocky shore, there's still only a teeny tiny portion of our state where you can find eelgrass. So we've got a situation where we've got the most productive uh, organism uh, on the planet living in these little teeny tiny places that are human dominated landscapes. So the pressure is really on uh, to balance that dynamic between the human uses of estuaries and the support that we need to provide 
to keep eelgrass thriving. As it turns out, there's two types of eelgrass in Oregon's estuaries. One of them is a non-native introduced species called uh, Japanese eelgrass or Zoster japonica. And the eelgrass that we've been speaking of mostly this evening is a native species called Zostra marina. And you can see the difference between the two types of them. So I just told you kind of a, an introduced species horror story, but now here's an introduced species of eelgrass. It, it, is that a horror story too? Well, I'll leave you to ponder that question while we move along a little bit here. It's a map of the Coos estuary, uh, the ocean out here, the north spit of Coos Bay. Uh, this is the area where the proposed uh, Jordan Cove liquefied natural gas terminal was. And oh gosh, look here. There's an eelgrass bed uh, or a seagrass bed right in front of where they wanted to dredge. Uh, Anu will get into that a little bit more. But note that some eelgrass meadows fringe the, the deep water area, and some of them are large open meadow expanses. So some uh, are adjacent to deep water, and some are out in the open exposed tide flats. That's very important if you're a fish. So if we look around, uh, on the, in the blue column, we have a sample uh, of eelgrass uh, in Oregon estuaries. So we've got the estuaries down here, Alsi Coos, Nastuka. And this is, this, there were 100 samples taken out of each estuary. And this is the percentage of the total area of each one of those 100 samples that was occupied by eelgrass. So you can see in Coos Bay, about 10% or 11.7% of the estuary uh, samples had eelgrass but nearly 20% of the non-native eelgrass, or the, nearly 20% of the estuary was coated with this non-native. If you look at the Umpqua River, only 5% was native eelgrass and 20% was non-native eelgrass. So we've definitely got a situation going on here with a non-native and a native eelgrass. And I'll leave you guys post questions about that uh, in the Q&A. The other thing that's challenging about looking after eelgrass is it's really dynamic. Uh, this is a map or a picture of the Aquina estuary and the dark green areas are the areas that uh, when the scientists went out to survey eelgrass, they found eelgrass in all these locations uh, on one of their uh, censuses of eelgrass in Aquina Bay. In 2012, they went back to census eelgrass using the same methods. And the red locations are the only locations that they found eelgrass, which means that all the eelgrass that was previously found, pardon me, all the eelgrass that was previously found along the shore had, what had disappeared in 2012. Here's an example of some much more thorough survey work that happened in the South Slough Inlet of Coos Bay. These are one, two, three, four different locations. So the different lines show different locations in the South Slough Inlet. But I think most everyone should be able to see that in 2017 and 2018, something serious happened to uh, the density or the number of shoots and each square meter of that eelgrass populations at certain locations in South Slough completely collapsed and they really haven't recovered. So if you're interested, since the seminar is about taking care of eelgrass in Oregon, if we want to take some action to do it, the action we should consider should consider what eelgrass needs to survive. It needs clean water. It needs a limited amount of nutrients, but not too many nutrients, because too many nutrients from sewage and that sort of thing, or from fertilizer runoff, changes the situation and there's algal blooms that suffocate the eelgrass. We don't want contaminants. We don't want a bunch of silt in the water because that they, you can bury this stuff. Uh, dredging eliminates the habitat, et cetera, et cetera. Diseases, these, these animals are vulnerable to diseases. We mentioned introduced species. So there's, a, there's kind of a shopping list of things that we need to consider. Uh, if we're going to, to look after eelgrass. But I can tell you one thing, caring for eelgrass in Oregon 
in, in a passive way, a passive approach to uh, eelgrass conservation just doesn't work. You have to take active steps uh, if we're going to keep track and care for eelgrass. First of all, we need to monitor the conditions of eelgrass in Oregon's estuaries because how would we know if it's getting more abundant or less abundant, if it's disappearing or what have you. And then we need written policies or regulations that identify those factors that are important to eelgrass support like clean water, dredging, et cetera, that those are regulated to protect eelgrass. And then we need, uh, we need to have some horsepower that's necessary to uh, restore the habitat that has been lost. Um, and that there's fortunately very outstanding methods available today now uh, that uh, we're learning a great deal about how to rebuild decimated populations. So that's it for my slideshow right now. And uh, my next cue is to uh, introduce Anu Swakar. And I've worked with Anu uh, for the last uh, several years, uh, and it's been really fun working with her. Um, I've been deeply involved in the Jordan Cove uh, energy proposal, uh, reviewing the permit applications. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to coordinate with Anu uh, as she has been instrumental in helping to uh, challenge some of the local land use decisions. So uh, I'm humbled and honored to introduce Anu Swakar and uh, turn it over to her. Hello. Everyone, I'm hoping everyone can hear me and I'm going to share a screen. Let's see if that will work. Can everyone see my screen? Not yet, Anu. Okay. Let's see if I can fix that. Hmm. Are you getting a message? I'm looking. Okay. Sorry about that. How about now? There you go. Looks good. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, so I guess it's going to show this dual screen view. Yeah, unfortunately, this happened last night in a webinar that I was attending as well. So you may have to do it this way for some reason. Zoom keeps changing things. So, OK, um, so I think. Let's see if I can. So sorry for the. There, Can everyone that, see that? That looks great. OK, great. Um, so um, hello, everyone. My name is Anu. And uh, as Philip mentioned, I am the uh, Coastal Law Project attorney. I actually started out as the Coastal Law Project fellow in 2019, but I am now proud to call myself an associate attorney at CRAG. Um, Craig Law Center works with communities across the Pacific Northwest. We provide our services for free or as close to free as possible. And we are client focused with a mission to provide legal aid for the environment. Um, and as you heard from Philip earlier, um, we are the second half of the Coastal Law Project in partnership with Oregon Shores. Uh, so the 
inspiration um, and the motivation for developing this primer was really the community and the people of Coos Bay. Um, and of course the estuary in Coos Bay. But the lessons we, we took from the case study that I'm going to present this uh, evening apply up and down the Oregon coast. Um, working alongside folks in Coos Bay was the first time I ever really asked myself whether eelgrass in Oregon was adequately protected and managed under our current policies and laws. And I really learned from Mike and so many other lovely folks that shared their expertise about how important the seagrass is for our coastal communities and for our planet. Um, by the end of tonight, I hope we can all begin the work on answering that question. Uh, since you heard from Mike, two things. Uh, one, this is a really, really important species um, and resource for animals and communities and it's a culturally significant resource for many tribes. Um, but you also heard that it is an incredibly complex species and managing it um, has to be active rather than passive. I like how Mike said that. Uh, our primer, which as Philip mentioned, will be out in a couple of days. Um, we'll focus on three things. Um, first, it aims to present an overview of existing management frameworks. Um, note that right now, eelgrass is managed by a diffusion of management activities by several different decision makers at local, at the local, state, and federal level. Um, and so that has interesting implications for addressing cumulative impacts to eelgrass and developing the data we need to make sure that we're understanding risks to eelgrass in Oregon and off our coast. Um, the second thing our primer aims to do is to look at how we can improve our existing frameworks to protect eelgrass, what we need to improve our management of this incredibly important resource. Um, one key point here, and one thing we've learned through our process with this primer is that our current frameworks more often than not manage human activities um, that impact eelgrass rather than through policy specific to eelgrass and its suitable habitat itself. Um, and so the third thing, but by no means the least important thing, it's incredibly important, is how you, the people who now care about eelgrass, um, can lend your voice to decision-making that involves it, um, whether that's project review um, or rulemaking. Because what we know is to make effective eelgrass protection here in Oregon possible. Um, so eelgrass protection that sustains and protects this resource. We need an empowered and inclusive grassroots movement at every level. Um, and we need to work alongside sovereign tribal governments and indigenous led organizations to achieve common goals when it comes to protecting this resource. Um, we really need regular folks across Oregon to ask decision makers to make eelgrass a priority given the risks we know it's facing right now. Um, and for that, people um, really need to learn about eelgrass itself, um, the natural history of it, the science, and most importantly, how to navigate decision-making related to eelgrass. Um, because as Philip mentioned, uh, the trial by fire that I faced, even being an attorney, um, was how to navigate these complex uh, frameworks. And so that's what I'm hoping to help y'all with today. Um, Jordan Cove, which Philip also mentioned, is an ongoing case study that illustrates how decision making um, related to project review can impact eelgrass in Oregon. Um, and it's a key ongoing case study, because it's not over yet, um, that I think will be helpful to share some takeaways, those key takeaways, um, or illustrate those key takeaways um, when it comes to protecting eelgrass in Oregon. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what we've learned um, in this most recent round of permitting related to Jordan Cove. And then um, I'm hoping we can all go through a little exercise together um, to get a sense of how commenting and testimony works related to eelgrass. Um, so Jordan Cove. Um, Jordan Cove was a 
is a, a project with three major components. It's a proposed liquefied natural gas facility on the North Spit. Um, it proposes dredging in the lower estuary um, to allow for increased LNG tankers to export uh, LNG to Asia and foreign markets. Actually, we're not sure it is Asia. Um, and it involves a 229 mile pipeline. The component that really impacted or had the uh, potential to impact eelgrass in this situation was the dredging activities and the related uh, associated dredging activities. So dredge material disposal and ongoing maintenance dredging once the uh, project was built, um, that really had the potential to impact eelgrass. Um, and there were several areas of permitting um, that involved decisions related to that eelgrass. So um, let's see if I can do that. All right, so at the federal level, you had a permit from the US Army Corps of Engineers that was required to expand the channel. Um, that permit uh, conduct the dredging um, to expand the federal navigation channel for Jordan Cove to export uh, the LNG uh, out of the, from the North Spit, spit and out of Coos Bay. Um, that permit, overlapped with a permit from the Oregon Department of State Lands. In fact, they share an application um, and that is governed by a whole separate set of rules um, known as Oregon's removal fill uh, statute. So you have the Federal Clean Water Act, um, section four of the Clean Water Act. You have the federal remove or the state removal spill statute. And then you had local land use permits um, from three different jurisdictions. Coos County, the city of Coos Bay, and the city of North Bend. Um, the Coos County permits were specifically for dredging adjacent to the uh, eelgrass bed we'll be talking to uh, in a moment. The city of Coos Bay uh, involved dredging right adjacent to it and mitigation of eelgrass that would be destroyed by the dredging. Um, and the city of North Bend involved dredge material transport. Um, DLCD, the Oregon Department of State Lands, um, or Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, excuse me, um, is our Coastal Zone Management Act Federal Consistency Review Authority. Um, and so at the end of this project, uh, they were responsible for addressing whether the federal permits, so the Army Corps um, permit and, and the FERC permit, which was related to the Nat Natural Gas Act. We're not gonna talk about that today. Um, they were responsible for reviewing whether these federal permits were consistent with enforceable policies in the state of Oregon, which involved estuary management plan provisions from these local jurisdictions. Um, I know that is head spinning. So I think what would help us is to maybe do an expert exercise, right? Just think about one particular local government um, approval um, related to mitigation um, of eelgrass or one particular application related to mitigation of eelgrass in the city of Coos Bay. Um, so I wanna talk us through writing effective comments. Um, first, let's take a look at this actual provision. I'm not sure if you can see that. It's a little narrow. Um, so the provision in, in around 2019 or the spring of 2019, um, Jordan Cove applied to the city of Coos Bay um, for a permit to mitigate eelgrass that would be destroyed in other areas of the estuary where they had proposed activities for the LNG terminal and for the export tankers. Um, and what mitigation is, um, is that it is, is restoration of eelgrass um, when, quote unquote, there are unavoidable impacts due to a proposed project. Um, the mitigation was proposed for this area that's west of the airport in Coos Bay called uh, 52 NA, 52 Natural Aquatic. Um, and if you notice, the aquatic unit management objective states explicitly that the unit contains eelgrass beds that must be managed and, and it must be managed to maintain the eelgrass's uh, productivity in that area. 
Um, some other key things to notice here. Um, new dredging is prohibited. Maintenance dredging is not applicable. Um, if you hop down to mitigation, it's allowed. Um, so when you think about commenting and why you should comment, right? Um, we're looking at three different things. You're assisting the decision maker, right? You're sharing your expertise, your perspective with the decision maker so that decision maker can make an appropriate informed decision. Um, and in this case, folks from all walks of life um, raise their voices. There were scientists, there were regular people, um, the local tribe, the confederated tribes um, of the Coos, Lower Umpqua and Siwaslaw Indians uh, asserted their sovereign power um, and hired an expert to point out to the city of Coos Bay um, that there were real risks here and Jordan Cove had not avoided impact to this resource. Um, and their mitigation proposal itself was inadequate. And it was inadequate in large part because it proposed dredging in a way that would neither mitigate the resource that was damaged and could hurt the existing resource adjacent to the proposed mitiga mitigation area. Um, and so this particular comment period was open for three separate open record periods for the public to submit their testimony and then respond to uh, evidence and materials that were submitted by Jordan Cove, the applicant. Um, so heading into this little exercise, um, one of the best ways we found to sort of express how to effectively um, su uh, submit a comment to a decision maker in a way that helps them make a decision um, about the particular concerns that you have um, is to use CRAC. And what that, start, what that stands for is um, conclusion, rule, application, and then conclusion. So the first part is really the issue that you're concerned about, right? Why are you turning up um, to speak today um, or submit your written testimony? Um, the second part, the rule, um, it's important to tie that particular issue to a criteria that governs it. Um, then you apply the rule to your concern, right? Um, and then you conclude by telling the decision maker what you think you ought to do um, in that situation. So tying the argument back to a criteria and policy is something that um, is tricky. Um, and so this is a, a graphic um, from a resource that is included in the guide by the Environmental Law Institute about writing effective comments um, that I think is pretty helpful. Um, so you'll see this is just a statement that says what is there, a rich history and may have many artifacts, the old farm at the end of our street. It's a rich history and has many uh, art artifacts. Um, that doesn't exactly tell a decision maker what to do with it. Um, so if you look at this example on the right side, you have a rule, you have the application, the old farm at the end of our street has a rich history and many artifacts. And then you have a suggestion as to what to do with that. Um, at a minimum, there should be a historical survey. All right, so let's turn back to Coos Bay. Um, the question the city of Coos Bay was facing was these two parts. First, we knew Jordan Cove was asking whether it could dredge up a part of the 52 NA zone to make a, an eelgrass mitigation site. Um, the city of Coos Bay needs to know, is this consistent with the criteria for 52 NA? Um, let's look at the dredging criteria again. We know mitigation is allowed, but can they dredge to mitigate a resource? Um, and I guess I'll give you a few minutes um, before I give you that answer, 30 seconds. Do that.
Okay, well, this will work better in a, a in-person situation, but I still want to give you a chance to take a look at that. So I can give you the actual outcome. Um, when we look back at this criteria, um, well, first, we need to make note that several people, right, and under 100, but so many people turned out and expressed their concerns about this resource. Um, and it went through kind of the gamut of just, it's not allowed in this area, or new dredging is only allowed for the purposes of the airport um, and not for mitigation. Um, it's not allowed because it would damage the, uh, the eelgrass, which is part of the management objective of this, this uh, aquatic unit. Um, in the end, the city of Coos Bay ended up accepting Jordan Cove's definition of dredging, which they repurposed as an enhancement and not dredging and ended up approving this permit. Um, and that permit approval still stands today. Uh, it, it just wasn't a good one to challenge. Um, and what this kind of shows us, right, hopping down to these key takeaways, um, is a challenge. Um, protecting eelgrass absent updated data and explicit criteria is really difficult. It goes back to what Mike Grable was saying. Um, a passive approach to protecting this resource is not effective. Um, and while Oregon Shores was successful in turning overturning um, a, or assisting in one case, overturning a couple of those dredging appeals, um, it really was not because of the, the community's preferences related to this really important vegetation, right? The community's preference to protect it. Um, and that also presents an opportunity, right? Um, we can improve the protection of eelgrass and its suitable habitat through permitting processes um, and specifically through rules that prioritize avoidance of impacts um, prior to development of mitigation, right? Um, and also clarify that dredging is not an enhancement. Um, and in those ways, you can make a difference. Um, you can participate at the local, at the state and the federal level in both project review and uh, rulemaking activities to, to improve those gaps, to close those gaps. Um, and that's what I really hope you'll take away from our primer, which is meant to start this conversation. Uh, so thank you and some time now for some questions. <laughs>